to say good morning to everyone. Good morning, good morning. What a joy it is for us to be here on this beautiful, warm morning. It's about to heat up here in Arizona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are going to go ahead and get started with Bible class. And before we get started, I'll open this up with a prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. Thank you for giving us this, this day, a day that we've never seen before, a day that you've given us as a result of your grace, your love, and your mercy for us. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to take advantage of this time. Help us to use this time wisely. Uh, as we, um, we know time is limited on this earth. Dear Lord. We just thank you for allowing us to come to faith, allowing us the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to study your word, to explore, explore your word, to delve deep into your word so that we can truly understand you, understand us, and understand your will for our lives. We thank you for all those who are in attendance, both in person and online. We just ask that our time together be beneficial, edifies everyone who is present, and that we learn something, not just for information, but transformation. And just thank you so much for your son, Jesus the Christ. If we're not for him, we would not have this opportunity to come together and to study and to learn and to love and to have salvation. And to come to you in prayer. It's in his name we pray. In the spirit. Amen. All right. So we have finished our spiritual discipline series. And uh, I don't know about you, but it stretched me a whole lot. In many ways that I didn't even expect. So I hope that that series and the application of spiritual disciplines, I hope that it was encouraging. I hope you were edified. I hope you were challenged. And I hope that uh, you saw and are seeing the benefits and the fruit of having a, a life that is disciplined uh, for the things of God so that we can enhance our connection, our intimacy with, with him as we live out our lives. So this spiritual discipline doesn't stop because the class stops. It continues. It continues on throughout our lives. The Christian life is a disciplined life. It's a life that uh, sacrifice is expected. Um, denying ourselves is expected. Taking up, taking up our cross daily is expected. Uh, having a, a sense of just self-control um, and discipline in our lives and taking advantage of the opportunities and the time that God has given us is all an expectation of Christianity. Hopefully, uh, you can still continue to engage in spiritual disciplines and be blessed by it. So this morning, I want us to approach a subject called the historicity. The historicity. Historicity. The historicity of Jesus. The historicity of Jesus. And this is in the, in the realm of apologetics. So apologetics, apologia is the Greek word to not apologize for, but to make a defense of the faith that is in us, being able to explain why we believe what we believe. So I want us to look at the historicity of Jesus because Jesus has a history. Jesus lived, was born, and died in the history of humanity. And there are many people who claim that Jesus did not exist. There are many skeptics, there are many scholars that say that Jesus was simply a made-up character. He's a fictional character. He didn't really walk the earth. He was just made up in the minds of man, and therefore his life is just a delusion, or it's an illusion, or it's just downright um, deception in a way to deceive people and to control people. So I want to... Uh, Approach this subject because we need to be able to have talking points with people who may claim that Jesus in fact never existed and if they don't believe in Jesus just coming to them with the Bible isn't going to be good enough if they don't believe in Jesus they're not going to believe in the scriptures so it's important for us to be able to have these conversations with people meet them where they are without having to even open up the scriptures so by understanding the historicity of Jesus, you'll be able to have a, a rational, a logical, and informed and educated conversation with people who simply will not um, open up their Bibles to see if these things are true. 
So just getting them to realize that Jesus, in fact, existed is the bridge, is the segue to lead them to the scriptures. Does all that make sense? All right, so let's delve into it. So there is a Jesus of faith, and there's a Jesus of history. There's a Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history. The Jesus of personal faith is malum, which means he can change. Uh, not really, but you know, regarding our personal experience, we pretty much make up the Jesus that we want in our lives. We make up the image, the character, the culture of Jesus uh, by our own background and our own, our own baggage that we bring to uh, our relationship with Christ. So the Jesus of personal faith, again, is malleable. He can be whatever we need him to be. He can be white, African, Latino, Thai, Chinese. He can be Republican, Democrat, American. However, the, 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 the history of Jesus is fixed. The history of Jesus, what we can learn through the scriptures, what we can learn through things outside of the Bible when it comes to Jesus, that's fixed. You cannot change that. So what I'm trying to get us to understand is sometimes we have an image of Christ that is inconsistent with the historical evidence and narrative of who Jesus actually is and was while he lived on earth. Bear with me. All right, so Jesus was born and lived in ancient Mediterranean Palestine. All right, he grew up in, in a, he grew up very poor, grew up in poverty without a formal education. If you are familiar with the scriptures, you'll know that when Jesus taught in the synagogues and the temple they said who is this man he's unlearned he's uneducated why is he talking with authority we know that he doesn't have a formal education he didn't follow or study under any rabbi how is he this intelligent how is he this wise how does he have this this wisdom and this authority which he speaks with knowing he was uneducated uh, remember when jesus um, was going to choose his disciples and they wanted them to come see a man from nazareth what they say about that? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. Nobody of importance, definitely not the Messiah. Of course, our, our Savior is not coming from Nazareth. Nazareth is a, is a small country town with podunk people. I mean, that was really the mentality of that day. These were people who were looked down upon. Uh, the town of Nazareth would have been about anywhere from 100 to 300 people, max population very poor, uh, people who were just trying to make ends meet. This, this is the history of our Savior. Not a very pretty one, but a very humble one. All right, so he was a revolutionary who launched a movement established on the kingdom of God. Jesus challenged and changed the religious and social culture of his day. He was very assertive. He was aggressive when he needed to be. He was also humble. He was also gentle. The, I try to explain to people that, that the Jesus that we can imagine is far more than, than, than what our minds can conceive. We often try to put Jesus in a box. Jesus cannot fit in, in, in any intellectual box we put him in. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about about the world of Jesus, the world of Jesus. What is known about Jesus' world is well known and well established in history. We may not know much about Jesus, which we don't. We actually don't know a lot about Jesus. In his 33 years of living, we have the last three years, which is the accumulation of the Gospels. And then we have little fragments of his life regarding his birth. When he was 12 years old, and then the last three years. There is not a lot of information about Jesus. But we know a lot about the world he lived in, which then can give us information about the surroundings, about the customs and the cultures of his time. So we know about the politics of that time. We, we know who was in rule, who was reigning. Roman Empire. Right? There were the political giants, the juggernauts of that time. We know about the temple and the social power it manifested. There was a lot of power and collusion uh, when it came to the priests and the Roman government. 
there was a lot of corruption during that time. So we, we understand um, the role of priests, high priests. We understand the, the, the role of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, scribes, lawyers or lawgivers. I mean, we understand these, these other cultural aspects of, of Jesus' um, history, of his culture. Uh, we understand wealth and what it meant to be wealthy back then. It had a lot to do with livestock. So we know about the currency of that time. Jesus mentioned it. Denarius is mentioned in scripture several times. So we we know a lot about the history in which Jesus, the culture in which he lived, while not really knowing a whole lot about, about him. We know of the food choices that were available during that time. Olives. Mentions of olive trees, fig trees, grains of wheat, grapes, wine, unleavened bread, fish. So we know what they ate. We know of the cultural and social norms at that time, such as circumcision, weddings. There's mentions of weddings in Jesus' history and culture, crucifixions, racism. Social status. We know of the Roman emperors, Caesar Augustus, and governors, Pontius Pilate, of first century Palestine. So, so we know quite a bit about the, the culture and the history uh, of Jesus. We're going to talk a, a bit about this idea of the crucifixion. Uh, I'm sure you know Jesus wasn't the only person to be crucified. Hundreds and thousands of people were crucified. Jesus just happened to be the only Savior, the only God who was ever crucified, but not the only person. So crucifixion uh, was for, for punishment for crimes against the state. And some of these crimes included insurrection, riots against the government, uh, treason, rebellion, things like that. These were punishable by crucifixion, hanging on a tree, hanging on a tree. A crucifixion was used as a deterrent to maintain social control under the Roman Empire. So it was to prevent people from rebelling against Rome, to prevent people from trying to create anarchy and overthrow the government. It was a way they kept the people of that time in fear of Rome, fear of death, fear of torture. The crucifixion was so brutal, so painful, so dehumanized that no one would dare rise up against the Roman government. What a lot of people don't realize is, even though in Scripture it talks about Jesus on the hill of Golgotha and things like that, when, when Jesus was crucified or when anyone was crucified, they weren't suspended in the air. As far as like, it wasn't the person we looked up at. When they put the cross or the stake in the ground that they were suspended on, it was at high level. You can walk up to them as they're on their cross, on the crucifixion. You can walk up to them at high level. And it just intensifies the, the, the basically, um, the, the pain. Um, and it puts you right on their level. So it's like, I, I can identify with this pain. And I can sympathize with them. I can see them face to face. And so it's a way to deter them. Crime of the assailant uh, was placed over their head in the crucifixion. Everyone would know what crime was committed. If you remember what was above the, the head of Christ when he was crucified? King of the Jews. That was his crime. That was, that's, that's what they, the Roman authorities put there that Jesus was accused of trying to overthrow the Roman kingdom, Roman Empire. Jews said, we don't have a king. Not Jesus. Caesar is our king. So that was his crime. Here is some archaeological evidence of crucifixion. So there is a, a replica and then an actual and then an actual archaeological find. 
So if you see the one on the left, where you have the wood and the foot and the nail going through the ankle bone, that's that's a replica of what they actually discovered. So the one on the right is an actual nail that went through the heel of a person that they dug up in Palestine. That is proof that crucifixion took place. And the nail was hooked on the end. Why do you think that is? So it can't come out. So they couldn't kick the nail off the cross. Yes, but it does. That's a good point. Yeah, and and I would probably have to study that a little bit more to see into what context of broken bones are we talking about. I don't see how you can nail a stake through someone's ankle and there not be some type of brokenness, but who knows? So this is just evidence outside of scripture that crucifixions actually took place. So it then just adds proof to the biblical account. And then, in my opinion, just confirms the faith we already have. Right? So what I want to do, I know this is going to be pretty wordy, you may or may not be able to see it, I'll try to read what I have here. So what I want to do is I want to look at evidence of Jesus outside of Scripture. So that we can have these talking points. So that we can have these rational, logical conversations with people who are very smart, very educated. And even in their education, they say that Jesus never existed. So here are some actual historical facts and evidence that Jesus existed outside of what the Bible All right, so Publius Tacius lived from 56 uh, to 120 AD. He was a Roman senator and historian who opposed Christianity. So he's not someone who was for Christ. He's not someone that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He was in opposition to that idea. But he wrote what he experienced during that time. So he was alive uh, shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus, but was was alive and well during the, the, the early church. And these are some things in which he wrote down concerning the early church. So just bear with me. It's going to be a lot of information. It's going to be really wordy. For some of you, you're like, this is boring. But this is, this is, this is interesting and it's something that we need to be able to have in our toolbox when we share the gospel with so this is what he wrote in his book, and, and these books can still be, they can be found, they can be ordered, you can buy these books today. Um, there are copies that have been reproduced, okay? So these are just some excerpts of some documents that we have um, that show that Jesus Christ actually lived without using scripture. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for the abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name has its origin, of course they mean Christ, Christus, from whom the name has its origin, the name Christians, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of the procurators, Pontius Pilate. The name sounds familiar? And most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. So if you, if you listen to the terminology, you see how they're confirming what the Bible already says. 
where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as a patriot against mankind. So again, proof that Christianity was alive and well in the early century, first century, that there were a group of people who called themselves Christians whose name originated with Jesus, that the church first started in uh, Jerusalem, right? That Pontius Pilate was responsible partly for the crucifixion of Jesus. All that is right here, and this isn't in the Bible. This is just another document outside of scripture of someone who did not believe that Jesus was God. I have more. Josephus. Josephus. Flavius Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. From 37 to 100 AD, he was a commander of the Jewish forces in Galilee and would later become a Roman citizen. And he has a lot to say about Christianity. It says, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. And his conduct was good. And he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate, there's that name again, condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that they had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophet, prophets had recounted wonders. So those are the, the references there where you can find these excerpts. Right? Josephus had a lot more to say. Festus was now dead, and Albanus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges. That word Sanhedrin sound familiar? Amen, Sister Gloria. And brought them the brother of Jesus, who was called. whose name was James. Does that sound familiar? The Bible says that Jesus had a brother. His name, his name was James, right? And James wrote one book in the New Testament. So here Josephus, a Jewish historian, outside of scripture, is testifying that Jesus lived, Jesus had a brother. Jesus was killed by so going back to James, whose name was James and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what was done. They also sent to the king, King Agrippa, discerning him to send to Amos that he should act as act so no more. Sorry, the wording is crazy. For that what he had already done was not to be justified. Nay, some of them went on to meet Albinus as he was upon his journey from Alexandria and informed him that it was not lawful for Aeneas to assemble a Sanhedrin without his consent, whereupon Albinus complied with what they said and wrote in anger to Aeneas and threatened that he would bring him to punishment for what he had done, on which account King Agrippa took the high priesthood from him when he had ruled but three months and made Jesus the son of the Manius high priest, not the same Jesus. Jesus was a popular name. But as you see the conflicts that was going on in, 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 in um, with Rome and the Jews, 
when it came to Christians and people being stoned, and they say that this is evidence that Jesus and Brother James were stoned. We don't know for a fact that it happened because that was the conflict. Did we stone these Christians or not? They're not really doing anything bad, but you know, people don't like them. Do we get rid of them? Do we kill them? Or do we let them live? These are ongoing conflicts with the Roman Empire and the Jewish um, Sanhedrin and councils when it came to the faith of Christianity or Christians. Alright, there's another external evidence. Gaius Sintonius. Gaius Sintonius lived from 69 to 140 AD. He was a Roman writer whose most famous work is his biographies of the first 12 Caesars. So that's what he specialized in. So he writes about Claudius. In Claudius 25, 4. In his book. He banished from Rome all the Jews who were continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Christus. Now there is a quote that corresponds to this in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them. Here's the parallel. The Bible talks about the same incident, and then you have a historian who wrote about the life of 12 prominent Caesars of this time, and he talks about Jews being exiled from Rome, in which we have evidence of that in Acts chapter 18, verse 2, the same emperor of that time. You think this is coincidence? No, it's confirmation. And if nothing else, we can at least take the scripture, the Bible. And if you don't want to believe that, that, that the Bible is God's word, you can teach the Bible as a document of history and still be accurate in what it says. Many people just solely perceive the Bible to be a religious document. Yes, it is. But the Bible is also historically accurate in everything that it says. And this is proof. Y'all with me? Alright, so there's some more evidence. Letters of Pliny the Younger and the Emperor Trojan. Letters of Pliny the Younger and the Emperor Trojan. So in the year 112, Pliny the Younger was faced with a dilemma. He was the governor in a Roman province of Bethina, modern-day Turkey, when a number of Christians were brought into his court. And this is what happened. See what happened. Yeah. This, is, this is his letter to the Emperor Trojan. He says, It is my constant method to apply myself to you for the resolution of all my doubts. For who can better govern my dilatory way of proceeding? pardon upon repentance, or whether it may not be an advantage to one that had been a Christian that has forsaken Christianity, whether the, the bare name without any crimes besides or the crimes adhere to that name be to be punished. In the meantime, I have taken this course about those who have been brought before me as Christians. I ask them whether they are Christians or not. If they confessed they were Christians, I asked them again. 
and a third top, intermixing threatenings with the questions. If they persevered in their confession, I ordered them to be executed. And it continues. However, they assured me that the main of their fault or of their mistakes was this, that they were wont on a stated day to meet together before it was light. I wonder what day that was. And to sing a hymn to Christ as to a God, alternately, and to oblige themselves by a sacrament or oath not to do anything that was ill, but that they would commit no theft or cliffering or adultery, that they would not break their promise or deny what was deposited with them when it was required back again, after which it was their custom to depart and to meet again at a common but innocent meal. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like Acts chapter 2. <laughs> In which they had left upon that edict which I published at your command, and wherein I have forbidden any such conventicles. These examinations made me think it necessary to inquire by torments what the truth was, which I did for two of two servants, two servant maids who were called deaconesses. These are women in the church. You read about them in Acts. One of them is named Phoebe. I don't know if this is who he's referring to, but we, we see the term deaconess in the, in the book of Acts. But still I discovered no more that they were addicted to a bad and to an extravagant superstition. So here's this, this man, this governor, serves the Roman Emperor Trojan and is trying to figure out what to do with these Christians in his court. And he threatened them, tortured them, getting them to deny their faith. And they would not. And then he was inquiring, well, what do I do with the young ones? Kids! We're talking about kids! What do I do with the teenagers, the preteens who believe in this Messiah? Do I, do I torture and kill them along with the strong men, the grown-ups? Do I treat them all the same? Do I show compassion to these children? So again, it just confirms that Christianity was prevalent during that time. That they truly changed the culture and the world of their day that Jesus, in fact, did exist, that there were Christians who met on Sundays, Saturday nights. Uh, they met for meals. They engaged in sacraments, which some may call the Lord's Supper. They determined to not do evil, to do anyone ill. They determined to not steal. <laughs> People without faith are confirming the faith that we have. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we'll watch a quick video that kind of surmises most of what we have discussed.
Interesting, right? Any comments or questions? Alright, so we'll go ahead and prepare to close. So just a quick scripture, quick question. It's kind of rhetorical. Uh, Matthew 16, verses 13 to 16 says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? Where he is? They reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. How do you define Jesus? The way we define Jesus will often determine how we respond to him. If he's just a good teacher, if he's just a prophet, then he has no authority. He doesn't offer us salvation. He has no power over our lives. But if we define him as Messiah, as Lord, as King, as Savior, then he has all the authority over our lives. Here's a quote I want to end with from C.S. Lewis. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, referring to Jesus. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claims to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said will not be a great moral, t moral teacher. He will be either a lunatic on the level of with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend, he did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic or a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. So I want to thank y'all for y'all time. I hope this was enlightening. I hope it was helpful. And I hope it helps you in, in your faith, but also in the way that we spread the gospel to people who may be skeptics or critics of Jesus or the scripture, um, to those who just may simply claim he did not exist. All right, let us uh, go to God in prayer, and we will prepare for worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We want to thank you again for allowing us to come together as believers. Uh, to study your word, to learn more about you, your son, uh, the church, and to see how your hands have been all over human history. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the, the extra biblical documents that have been preserved that just confirm what is already in your spoken word and your written word, word Heavenly Father. We thank you for uh, historians and we thank you for the scholars who have put these uh, things together so that our faith, again, can be validated and affirmed. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that our time uh, has been encouraging and edifying uh, with one another. And dear Heavenly Father, we prepare our hearts for worship. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, not to just draw near to you with our lips, but our hearts are close to you. That you are in our hearts, that you're dwelling in our hearts, and that you are transforming our hearts so that we can look more like you in our daily life. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.